Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. This is the Institute of Health and Social Care Management in partnership with the one and only Royal Wolverhampton Hospital NHS Trust and Walsall Healthcare NHS Trust. Uh, and here we are. It's, it's the latest in our Let's Talk Talk series. And today, goodness me, what an exciting day we've got. We've got, let me get this absolutely right here, Hayley Langford. Hayley, give us a wave. Is that that's the wave? Good, good, good. And Lee Dillon, Lee, give us a wave. There we are. You see, this is a bit like the BBC, something like that, you know, at the end of a game show. Um, but Lee and Hayley, they are the cream of the crop in respect of district nursing. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Really, the, the Wolverhampton Warsaw approach to district nursing. And we're going to learn all about it. You'll have to slightly forgive me. I have had a cough over the last couple of weeks. It's on my, it's on its way out, but periodically you might hear me just peffing a little bit um, quietly. I hope you can indulge me. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Lee and Haley, compliments of the season to you both. Obviously, an exciting time. Uh, lots of people in Wolverhampton and Walsall, and perhaps even the wider area, relying on district nurse service to come and look after them and make sure they're, they're well and healthy and fit to get through the Christmas period. Give us an idea of the scale and scope of your operation. How many of you are there within the district nursing service and what sort of a population size and region do you do you serve? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll start and then I'll hand over to Hayley. So I'll give you a bit of a background around demographics of Wolverhampton. So we cover the city of Wolverhampton. So we're a citywide community service. Um, our population is roughly between 250 to 260,000 population. Wolverhampton being quite a diverse um, population um, overall. And we have four district nursing services um, that are split, uh, split the demographics of the um, Wolverhampton population up. Um, I'll let Hayley give a bit more of a detail around the, the team dynamic. Yes, yeah, so as Lee just touched on, we are four teams across the city. So we're north, east, south and west, and that's by like geographical patches of the city. Um, combined as a whole, there's around 115 to 120 of us uh, staff wise across the city. And that's a combination of myself as matron, um, our band sevens, band sixes, band five nurses, uh, band four nurse associates and band three healthcare assistants. Um, the, the teams are split according to the skill mix and caseloads across the city um, and then they deliver all of the, the care in the people's um, preferred place of care or, or homes, residential homes and uh, patients' actual homes as well. Well, thank you. It, it's often, I think, if I'm right here, and you, you correct me if I go off piste at any stage here, but I always think district nursing is a is a is a more complex than people who are outside of it might speculate, because you can be doing everything from wound care to catheter, from stitches removal to uh, uh, wound dressing or continence and so on. You're across the whole sort of thing. How how does somebody go about training in the first instance to be a district nurse? Can one of you perhaps give us a a kind of a part of history what's involved because your skills mix must have to be pretty broad I would guess. Yeah ab ab absolutely and as, as you've just mentioned the the kind of patient uh, that we now have in community is more complex their needs are more complex we're seeing younger patients with long-term conditions patients with multiple long-term conditions um part of Wolverhampton we're seeing patients living longer which is great but naturally living longer comes with more complex needs and long-term conditions um, and we're having to constantly adapt to that so what district nursing used to be like say pre-covid is genuinely not what district nursing is now post-covid um, and so in terms of being a district nurse now you do your normal three years um, registration training at university you'll get a wide range of experience between acute and community and you'll rotate on your placements and things um, but something that we were really passionate about and I think a lot of people that manage community services and particularly the district nurses 
we've over the years seen a massive decline in district nurses wanting to like nurses wanting to be district nurses and holding the district nursing qualification um, and because of that and the, the increased vacancy factor that we were seeing and it's not just a local problem in Wolverhampton it's a national problem where we're seeing a decline in district nurses that we wanted to look at how could we grow our own district nurses so yes, they've done three years training, which is great. They'll have a wealth of experience. But how do we help them consolidate that in a community environment where they're lone working practitioners, autonomous, looking after really complex patients in a really complex environment as well? It's not a staged environment in the acute where you have like your six or seven beds and you know you've got everything around you at hand and it's you know IP compliance and all the rest of it. You're going in um, and you're having to risk assess from the point that you hit their their door really on 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 safety and how can you provide the same quality of care in a safe way to patients at home. So we kind of I, I reached out to Sam Sherrington to to look at how do I learn from other really good community services nationally and how can we kind of like cherry pick some really good practice and kind of mirror that in Wolverhampton. Um, and we then developed a five week program and I'll let Hayley talk a little bit more of that mm. in, in a bit of detail shortly. And that was about us kind of growing our own workforce, investing in them. What we were doing was recruiting new people that have a few weeks supernumerary period. And then we'll, we're giving them a list of patients that are really complex. And we were finding that they weren't having a very good induction period. They were staying with us. They were then going to move and work somewhere else because actually the, the transition period was just not as great as we would have liked it. And that was partly our fault because we had so many vacancies. We needed people to kind of hit the ground running um, to meet the, the needs of the patients. But actually what we found was actually if we invest in them over a five week period, help them consolidate, help them build the foundations of what a really good district nurse looks like, give provide them the, the theory, the practical, some body mentorship yeah. and all of that and kind of help them become a little bit more confident and competent in delivering a really good service that they felt that they'd been supported within that transition. Um, so that was really important for us. Um, and we learned a lot from Tameside um, district nurses who were doing a fantastic job around recruitment, retention, boot camps. Um, you know, I was we were really impressed. And actually, we developed a lot of our models in 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 relation to what they were doing. But I'll let Hayley just talk a little bit more around the boot camp and around how we're kind of like developing our workforce now. Yeah, so I think uh, just to echo what Lee had said, um, me especially working within the district nursing teams, um, I held a lot of exit interviews with the staff that were leaving us uh, to kind of find out why they were leaving, what was the reason and how could we learn and move forward from it. And, and as Lee's touched on, it was because of the induction, uh, most of those. So Lee had the idea of a boot camp style induction programme. Um, which we all really liked, to be honest, um, and I kind of went with that. So I was in touch with Warsaw Healthcare Trust, our neighbour trust, to see what induction programme they had. Um, and then I kind of developed this in, this induction programme. So looking at the different types of things that I felt was imperative and, and needed to be um, part of it for the staff, you know, to be a, a community practitioner. So I kind of developed this four week program and then reviewed it with Lee and then we soon developed it into a five week program and it got even larger. Um, so just some things that are, just, are on just that. To be uh, clear, they, just to be clear, your new recruits go through this yeah, before you yeah. release them into the patient facing environment. Yeah. So, yeah, so it, essentially, yes. However, we can't um, run a five week <coughs> programme every time somebody starts with us. So if somebody starts with us as a new starter um, and the boot camp isn't until three weeks time, then they will have that settling in period with their team and getting some exposure. But then they're pulled out of clinical practice to go on to the programme. Um, and, and then obviously everybody gets the same opportunity then. Yeah. Perfect. So just to, just before you go on to tell us about what you do yeah. in the boot camp, can I just go back to this complexity and how the role of district nursing has evolved and become more complicated over the years? Could could you give us an understanding kind of how, how many appointments would uh, one of your experienced district nurses 
expect to undertake during a typical working day? Um, it could. It depends, really. So it depends on the type, the the time of, of each visit. But roughly, anything between eighteen patients to about twenty two, depending on the what they're length. going out to see, yeah. their shift length. So it might be slightly more if they're doing long days. So we introduce a little more flexibility around. Um, our workforce especially the newer generation now they want to do longer days so they want to yeah. do three long days and have a block of time off because that suits them and their needs so, we so had what, to be what would a long day be that. in terms of what would a long day be in terms of hours worked eight eight till eight yeah eight a.m till eight p.m yeah so our so working a, day is eight till eight okay um, so that's a 12 hour shift and in that yeah. they might on average they might be seeing 20 if not patients. more, I mean, they are, yeah. they are they are tearing about in that case, aren't mm -hmm. they? I mean, they're they're barely having time to draw breath, and they've got to presumably they've got to get there, they've got to park, they've got to get organised, they've got to do an assessment, and then they move into whatever the treatment traffic requirement might be. Yeah, exactly. You know, this yeah. is this is not a job for the faint-hearted, is it? It's not, and our mornings are like really busy, like any community district nursing service. So we have about 150, 160 diabetics in the morning that we have to see, and they're time sensitive. So you can imagine they have quite a core amount of diabetic patients that are timely. They've got a window in which to see them. Yeah. Um, and then you might want to throw in a few end of life patients so we're also commissioned in Wolverhampton to provide health and social care for end of life patients in the community again complex we're starting to see really young people um, with yeah. terminal illnesses in the community a lot of it probably as a result of covid and um, reduced appointments investigations and so forth so we're seeing a lot of that in the community um, and, you know, you're trying to see them in the morning, so they might have full personal care needs. There might be some um, emotional support and psychological support that you need to provide at that visit. Right. Symptom management, a syringe driver. So a syringe driver is something that we use to give ongoing um, pain relief and symptom control to, to patients in, in their terminal phase. Um, you're supporting the family through that process as well. So trying to get and allocate um all these different variations of visits so you have some really high priority stuff so we kind of work off a priority matrix so our red priority are you must see so your timed medication visits such as insulin your end of life care patients your complex wounds um anybody that might be vulnerable and at risk of sepsis or um hospital admission but this is what you're up against you know the team leads are doing an allocation on a daily basis and constantly trying to make sure that all patients are seen within line with their personalised management plan, um, that the nurses get a break, um, opportunity to come back and debrief about their day, particularly um, a for the last few months we've had some really sensitive um, end of life patients, some of which have worked for our organisation. So our team actually know these that there were nurses and we've then had to provide um, end of life care. So giving them the opportunity to be able to reflect, debrief. Hayley's a, um, a PNA, so she provides some pastoral support. To, um, so to just for people well. who may not know, PNA? A professional nurse advocate. Thank you. You see, if we don't ask, we won't know. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, it's a very full answer that you've given, but it just it, it, it kind of reinforces the view that this is this is not a straightforward um, career. And it, it must be filled full of all sorts of fulfilling and interesting and sort of um, exacting work that makes you feel, you know, kind of you put in a full day shift at the end of it. But it yeah, is absolutely. it is it is a demanding role. It is. And we're, ne we're definitely moving to a whatever you can do in an acute hospital, you can do at home now. And we're trying to move that model where and I think there's a lot of stigma, especially with acute, that they feel that in community that we must only do wound care yeah. and capitus. Yeah. But actually, we do so, so much more. Yeah. And I think it's us. I think historically as community services we're not very good at 
shouting out our successes, yeah. shouting out what we actually do, because you know what, community nursing do a fantastic job. Um, the emphasis is at care at home, care closer to home. And that's what we're trying to adapt in Wolverhampton. We're trying to be adaptable to the ever changing needs of our population in Wolverhampton so that we can keep patients at home, because actually we know patient outcomes are far better when patients are at home. So we're trying yeah, to very much but the, and, and the flip side of that, of course, there is an intimacy to home mm -hmm. care. You are you are going into somebody's home mm -hmm. and the you know that puts a different dimension on the extent to which you have to empathize, show respect, and this kind of stuff. Because it is, it's more intimate than being in a in a hospital ward, I would suggest to you. But uh well, all right, let, let's push on. Hayley, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the content of the boot camp and how you've constructed this? Yeah, I think I think for me, I'd been I've been. And I know that you know, sorry, just I know you've got a video. So whenever you want to play the video, you say so. OK, yeah, so we'll the, I'll just touch on the video. So the video was just kind of one of the things that we did when we were um, looking at what we could do differently to try and attract people to come and work for us. So it's like a bit of a promotional video. Um, you know, it's some of our, our nurses that are still with us now, um, just explaining the, the service and why they should come and work for us because we were at one point in a really dire situation with staffing. Um, and, and I'll just touch on that now while I'm on the subject, but we yeah, had do, six, do. 16 um, whole whole time equivalent nurse vacancies um, last year registered registered nurses so 16 That's vacancies 10 percent then it was an, of your an, total. An, yeah an awful awful lot of nurses we had a really really high number of unallocated patients um, that we weren't able to see a high number of new referrals with a long wait time for us to get out to see them um, and we were looking at things of how how could we redesign the service and what could we do differently as well as the boot camp and giving them the induction we needed to get people to actually want to come and work for us to start with so what so what so, was what was when you were doing exit interviews and so on what were yeah. the prime reasons why people were choosing to leave yeah so we we had staff that had, that were completely leaving the nhs as a whole yeah. So, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic really, really hit us, it hit us hard. So we had, um, after that third wave, it was during the, the December, January, it was over that Christmas period, we had quite a high number of uh, staff turnover at that point. And um, as I say, some had, had left the trust, but as uh, uh, nurses in, in general, they didn't want to be a nurse anymore, which was really, really sad to see. Um, the staff morale was at a real all time low. Um, this is driven by exhaustion, frustration, yeah, burnout, money, everything, yeah, you know, but staff okay. burnout. Um, we had a really, really uneven skill mix across the teams, across the city. So at that time, we were six teams across the city. So we had a look at what what could we do differently. We we redesigned the service. Um, so the, the promotional video was one thing. So to try and get attract people to come and work for us, we were offering flexible working contracts, as Lee had briefly touched on. Um, longer days wasn't something that we kind of offered. Um, we've always done the typical shorter shift, earlies and lates. Um, but we do have a bit of a longer day now that some of our existing staff have opted for. And, you know, that's going to help us retain them as well. Um, we kind of design, designed our own logo, so we've got a little bit of a brand as well now. Um, we also <clears throat> developed um, task and finish groups, so looked at what our priorities were for um, the, the, the teams in general. So we had like caseload processes, digital systems, the induction programme, um, and then we restructured the whole city. So myself and the previous matron we got together we pulled all the staff together and split us into four new teams so everybody was split into four equal teams that was patients caseloads and staffing so everyone was equal across the city with regards to um the complexity of patients the areas um the mileage that they were covering 
and the skill mix of staff as well. So some staff have been here for a very long time and have got a wealth of knowledge, but then we've got really new staff that weren't obviously having a great start because they didn't have someone to buddy up with um, and to get that experience from. So we redesigned the whole city and remapped us into four new teams, which is what we have been now for around 18 months, um, which are North, East, South and West. So naturally, they do cover a, a slightly larger geographical patch across the city, um, but it is much more equal now. Um, and, you know, the, the teams do obviously blur the borders slightly when they're supporting one another. But it's all about communication and supporting each other. Which is, so which so is can really I just cool. ask, you know, th th this is your profession is by, by its very nature. It, it can be quite lonely because you're out there on your own going into people's homes and so on. And I just wonder, could you just talk about, you know, one of the issues with managing remote workers is how do you keep them feeling that they belong? How do you keep them feeling that they've got people within their profession they can talk to? How do you make sure that they can develop friendships within their own workforce and team colleagues and so on? Could you just very quickly talk about how you've, how you've engineered that or re-engineered that? Yeah, um, we, we've we've got um, so we have daily safety briefs so they can do that via coming in face to face or they can do that remotely. We do encourage face to face because I think we lose with COVID and working remote uh, remotely all the time. I think it's really difficult to have sometimes a meaningful conversation without all those personal um, <laughs> skills that you can have um, from a face to face conversation. Um, so we try to encourage that that kind of um, communication. They've got like Teams, so Microsoft Teams chats. So they've got a team chat that they can kind of like troubleshoot it. So yeah. I've got this problem. Can you help me? Can you help me help me out? Um, we do monthly team meetings. Um, so there's various different forums for them to kind of get together and have that interaction with their teams. Um, it's obviously not the same as what it was pre-COVID. I'll be honest with you. You've got a, an element of your workforce that really like to be agile working. Um, they see the value of agile working in terms of how many patients they can actually impact and go and see and, and things as opposed to that travel time of coming into a base um, and then getting caught up with stuff that goes on in the office that then puts them behind. Um, so from that perspective, but I think the boot camp helps with those building the relationships. And that's something that we didn't have before. They spend five weeks with like minded people that are new to coming to our team that they get to build relationships with. We then slowly drip feed them into their team, but keep pulling them back. So they then start building relationships with the wider team. I think Good. as a community service, we're really um, visible, aren't we? Yeah. So even from a manager's perspective, we like to be interactive with our workforce. We like to hear what's going on. We like to know what their challenges and barriers are. So we can kind of look at how do we support them? What are their ideas? What would they like to see more of? What do they want to see less of? So I think we've got quite an open kind of um, culture within yeah, the definitely. service and around building relationships, but also not just keeping it to their little direct team. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets to know each other outside of their team. And I think that was really important for us because I could have said to you, John, that I'm moving you into the north, out of the south for the day because the north needs some help. And you'd have had a panic attack about it because <laughs> I don't know anybody in the north and I don't want to go and work in the north because I don't know anybody. So by doing a boot camp, by restructuring, we've really standardised everything, haven't we? So it doesn't matter where you work within our locality of Wolverhampton, the processes are the same, the way we work is the same. And we felt that, and I think the teams felt that was really important because previous to COVID, what I might have been doing in the West, Hayley might have been doing something completely different in the East. Although we're doing like the end product's the same, how we got to the end product was like, quite variable um so I think we've done a lot of that and we did um back to what floor. was it back to floors so we've done back to floors where we've gone and spent time with the teams um we've had some team building sessions haven't we um I'm trying to think is it the art of brilliance yes um so we had somebody from um there come and do some workshops with us to kind of help improve working relationships people getting to understand how everybody does things the different types of leaderships um with, within our structures of community services um so that was really um positive as well so 
All right. So that that's fine. Haley, why don't you tell us about the boot camp now? Yeah, so so the boot camp is a robust induction program, as we've briefly touched on, for all new starters. So it was um, initially designed for district nurses, so for us in plan care, so plan care district nurses. Um, we designed it because we, as we've said, we had a high turnover of staff. We had a lot of new starters that were due to start with us. And how were we going to induct the, these people robustly? But, but, you know, quite quickly at the same time, it had to be done like quite quickly, didn't it, Lee? So how are we going to do that um, and make sure that they had a good start to, to, to ultimately retain them and want them to stay and work for us? All right. So, so could you just just explain the structure of the boot camp, yeah. perhaps, first of all? Is it? Yeah. It's in a certain number of parts or something like that. Just explain yeah. the structure to us. So it's it's <laughs> laid out as like a timetable um Form. So at where we're based at the Science Park um, in Wolverhampton, we block book one of the rooms here and the boot camp is run in that room every day for five weeks. So the first day the staff um, attend the boot camp and they get introduced into the portfolios that they're working in and they get given their merchandise. So we had some merchandise that was made specifically for the boot camp with the logos on for the portfolio. So for district nurses, it's got our, port, um, our little logo on there and says Wolverhampton District Nurses and they get a little goodie bag. So a, a tote bag with a folder, pen, lanyard, mug. Um, competencies like everything is all in this folder ready for them along with their revalidation paperwork um so everything's there ready for them to start and their timetable so they know exactly everybody what everybody doing. loves merch they do so, they love a freebie so what sort i mean clothing wise what are you going to give them a nice oh, waterproof they get they get this fleece they get a fleece but what if it's yeah. raining do they get a waterproof coat they get their coat they get, do they get an umbrella yeah, they get. Well, I'm not sure about an umbrella, but it's you need to get them an umbrella. <laughs> Honestly, get them an umbrella. You watch; they'll uh, they'll worship you. Get them an umbrella each. The future <laughs> efforts just. Um, they'll also get their. We call it on the boot camp. It's their survival kit. So yeah. it's their nursing bag. You know their observation equipment. They get an iPad, their work phone, um, obviously all their merchandise. Uh, they get all of that issued to them on that first day. Excellent. So okay, they get all of that. So that they're they're really readily equipped for their future nursing career out here. Then, so that's all on the first day, and it's kind of slowly eases them in. Other things that are on the boot camp, we focus on like governance aspects of things and reporting, yep. how to report incidents. Um, we go through policies and procedures with them, especially like um, attendance and uniform policy and their expectations of, of us from them here. Um, we let them introduce um, have a meet and greet with all the leads. So our portfolios in adult community out here, we are just one fraction of that as district nurses. We also have our virtual ward, our urgent care, our rapid access social care. We have care coordination and we have the clinics as well. So they get to meet all the leads for all of those services. And they also get time to go and spend time in each of those as well so that they can see how we all work closely together to ensure that the patient's safe at home. Because ultimately, as we've said, we want to keep the patients at home safely. So how do we all work together to, to get that end goal for the patient? And is, and is, that, is, is this modular? So you kind of over the five weeks, have you got? certain modules that that you've designed could you just maybe give us the titles if you have um not modules as such we have um on a wednesday it's called wound wednesdays so tissue viability uh team from the trust uh take over on every wednesday okay, and they that. deliver yeah. training on a wednesday so they do all the competencies with the staff um look at their like compression therapy they do like theory and practical sessions on each other with the bandages to try and start looking at their techniques and things um so that's all incorporated into this as well so then obviously when they're released into their teams they've got some knowledge and understanding of how to apply bandages etc um okay. which is which is really good and they've actually all the feedback that we've had from all of them so far have been that the wednesdays are their favorite so that's really good so the other parts of the boot camp notwithstanding the governance and safety yep. and reporting and uniform and so on the other parts of the boot camp are clinically based skills development would that be fair 
Yeah, clinical based skills development. Um, they look at what they should do when they're completing the paperwork and the assessments, even to the point of getting all their computer logins, um, yeah. how to use their iPad, because, you know, there's that many systems and documents that we have to, you know, well, use. I'm, I'm here. Gonna, don't go there yet. I'm going to come on ah. to the whole business of <laughs> IT and Wi Fi okay. and, and all the rest of that. But but yeah, so basically, clin this is clinical, clinical skills yeah. and then combined with operational necessities yeah. that help them understand how they're going to be able to interact yeah. with RWT on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. The boot camps I could bolt on to, we have mandatory trust training. So everybody that's a new starter to the trust has, um, dependent on their role and the department that they're working, have a set of mandatory yes. training mm. components that they have to do. So they have to do that as part of any new starter into the, any organisation. Um, so this is like a bolt on to like an addition to that. So how do we enhance and, and kind of take it a step further that's a bit more bespoke to adult community services, particularly district nursing. So it's it's more tailored to what's going to be beneficial to them in the community nursing um, situation. All right. Um, can I ask can I ask some detailed stuff now? OK, so you've recruited this district nurse. Uh, she or he are going to work in a particular region within a particular team. They might not have an intimate knowledge of that region in terms of street layout, um, traffic hotspots, that kind of stuff. The, some of them may not even use a car they may go by bike or who knows you just tell me how do you help them with this business of getting to appointments you know parking if that's a necessity and then moving on to the next one because it would strike me if i was a district nurse one of my big anxieties is how am i going to get to these places on time and how am i going to be you know parking safe whatever it might be whilst i do that how do you help them with that during boot camp? Um, so I think that with regards to so all of our staff must, you know, drive a car. We we don't um we don't use a bicycle out here. It's definitely okay, just a car. That's all right. I just, so I, you know, I can hear our greener care <laughs> special interest group going, oh we, no, yeah. they're missing it. But all right, they all drive a car. So how we, do you help them to get to their appointments in a timely manner and park? Yeah, so I think especially with the staff that have been in the team for quite some time, you know, they will be able to help navigate them, you know, which patients to go to first, etc. However, our allocation system where all of our patient visits are allocated, it, it links through to Google Maps. So if they click the patient where they're next going to and they're not quite familiar of how to get there, it will link it through to Google Maps and it will direct them of how to get to the, the patient. So on their work phone they're able to utilize the the app where they where their list of patients go to because we are completely paperless in wolverhampton um it would it will direct them where they need to go okay. to next and yeah. you know, i've lived in i've lived in wolverhampton so i know particularly as you get towards the city center how difficult parking can be how do you help with that is it just um every person for themselves and it's just you know do what you can how do you help them with that yeah, that, that's really, really difficult, if I'm honest with you. Um, I think we tend, if I'm being completely honest with you, we don't get many patients directly in the middle of the town centre as to where we have no parking, um, where we can't park. What we do put on, though, is alert. So, for instance, if there's a problem in getting to a patient or it's not quite clear cut, we have directions and we'll put something in place that whoever then goes out to that patient knows exactly how to get there or where to sure. park that's okay. suitable. Um, but in, if I'm honest with you, John, we don't, I've only ever, myself, having been a district nurse, only ever had to go into town once. For that patient and I'm not going to lie it was a difficult um yes yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. um, but yeah in the main no um but I mean I live in I live in I live in Cardiff or just outside of Cardiff huge areas of Cardiff now on the on street parking it's residence parking only um you know and if you don't have a permit you are going to get ticketed you know yeah. so it's really I would imagine that's probably going to come to Wolverhampton how yeah. are you going to cope 
so part of one so we we've got a, um, a bit of a collaborative um work stream in Wolverhampton where we work with different sectors that offer some form of um service to the population of Wolverhampton so with the council with social care and stuff and these are the things that we're trying to work towards how do we support one another so for instance just as an example we have wound care and they produce a lot of clinical waste as a result yeah. of it especially if you get bilateral legs and it's like really smelly odorous kind of yeah. um, clinical waste horrible stuff yeah. It's taken us probably two plus years to get an agreement with the council to now collect clinical waste without it being charged, without a special, like, you know, jumping through all these hoops. It's taken us over two years to, to get to this point. And, but because we've now started doing relationship building and stuff, they're now giving us avenues in which they're supporting us because they know it's for the benefit of the patient and they want to dispose of that waste in the right way. So it's Perfect. in their best interests as well. So we've actually done something with them. And I, I think you, you have made a valid point. We need to work with them now around how do we get access. better access to parking in in places that only a permit mm. for permit holders to help us support patient care because what we don't want is nurses having to then park a distance away from a patient to be able without to an umbrella <laughs> yeah. yeah well not just that there's all the safety elements isn't there like you know depends uh, on where they are in Wolverhampton if they walk like you know people might think that they're carrying medications with them when actually we don't but 100%. like you know the perception of us walking around with a nurse's bag is the perception that we're a prescriber and we might have a prescribing yeah. pad and we've got medications on us and we become an instant target so we need to look at how we better facilitate those kind of situations no, it's, these, it's these everyday practical things that make or break the individual's love of the job you know Absolutely. and you, you would you would know this um you know it's 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 the stuff it's the small stuff that makes the biggest difference to people but um yeah well, OK, Look, we, so we're getting that. What do they get at the end of the boot camp? I'm just interested. If it's a pat on the back, say it's a pat on the back, but I'm, I'm oh, es hopefully they're going to say something a bit yeah. better. Yeah, hopefully, you know, they'll they'll gain a lot of knowledge and skills as to and a, a real insight of community nursing and start to look at achieving their competencies um, to, to, you know, be a, a, a fully registered community nurse. Um, they do get a certificate because obviously they've attended a 37.5 hour times five um, induction programme. So that will go towards their like revalidation if they're a yep. registered nurse as well. So they can use those hours towards that, which is which is really good, isn't it, as well? Some of some of the nurses that we're getting um, are newly qualified. So they're just starting from from fresh. But some are experienced nurses from like an acute setting. So it is still really new to them. But equally, they'll be able to use those hours towards their revalidation as well. So, yeah, they do get a certificate um, that Ouch. I have designed with that. Uh, medical ill team badge do they get a badge a badge oh not no i haven't got you, a badge you see the, the, <laughs> this, this, also, you need to make notes here umbrella badge yeah. you know umbrella this is badge. the small stuff that every, i've never met anybody working in any role in the nhs that doesn't love a badge yeah, or no, a a badge. Badge. and it's a pen as well they're like a pen love it okay perfect do you want to play the video now and just because I want to talk to you about recruitment in a, in a yep. minute or two. Um, so perhaps now is a good time to play the short video, Jade, if you could oblige. Thank you. Sorry, could I just interrupt for a moment? I, I can hardly hear this. Um, so you might maybe just want to pause it and fiddle around with the volume a little bit. Thank you. Hi, and welcome to Planned Care District Nursing. Working in the community is a great place for you to develop. There's plenty of opportunities to learn new things. I love the fact that every day is different as a district nurse. We do medication, wound care, 
catheterisation and end of life patients, which is truly rewarding. We take a pride in making a difference to the patients we look after, as a district nurse, no day is the same. The opportunities are endless. It's a lovely place to work. I joined the Trust from qualifying in January 2020. I've worked with great teams and I really love my job. We are a friendly and supportive team here in the district nursing. I appreciate and I'm really thankful for the nurses to come to attend to me. The variety of shifts available make it possible for me to maintain a healthy work-life balance. We're a caring team who support flexible work and out-of-work commitments. Come and find out more. We look forward to hearing from you. Come and join us. Thank you, Jade. Haley and Lee are back. I think that that was okay. That they, 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 I mean, I loved, I loved the the joy that the full sense of fulfilment that the video provides. Talk to us a little bit about the the how do you go about recruiting people to come and work for your team? You know, this is a in, immensely competitive field. You you know, every every department is short of good people. How do you, how do you go about it? I know you've got your video, but what else do you do? Yeah, so I think I think the boot camp forms part of it. So that's something that we can say if you come and work for us, we're going to support you in developing and help build your confidence and your competence to be a really good district nurse. Um, so in terms of recruitment, we we obviously use NHS jobs, we promote um, our services. So um, any forum around comms, we do job of the week um, with our communications team to try and promote internal transfer. So one thing that we do have at RWT, being an integrated trust, um, we do internal transfer process. So an acute nurse can internally transfer into the community should they, they wish to. And we've had a lot of, of our workforce that wanted a change um, to come and work, um, work in community. Um, like you've just said, everyone's looking for really good district nurses. So you tend to find, particularly across our system in um, the Black Country, people are just moving from one place to another place. So you tend to feel, you, like we might be filling our gaps, but we're creating another gap yeah. that's going to have an impact somewhere else that's locally um, to our trust. Um, so we, we've done that. We've gone to recruitment events where we've we've gone and had a stall and we've talked about everything that we we offer um, we offer specialist practitioner like everybody and we've tried to raise the numbers in in how many we can have each year which is nationally funded um, and I, I think nurses of today want to develop they want to see a career pathway they want to see what that looks like what the future looks like for their nursing career so we try to support the development um, of that we've had in-house um, recruitment sessions at New Cross and at the science park in the community uh, where we've kind of we've into we've asked people to come and visit so we can show them around come and speak to the team yourself come and see what you you think of come and speak to people that are actually working for us um and i think the biggest thing that we've had for recruitment is word of mouth People have heard about what it's like to work in Wolverhampton District Nurses. They've heard about the boot camp and the investment. I think the branding's gone a long way that people feel like they're part of mm -hmm. something. And it's it's interesting. You put a logo on something that they feel is theirs and they 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 kind of helped us design that. It's made a massive difference. People feel like that this is their work family now and they, they belong to something and they're part of that vision. And I think that's really important. So I think usual recruitment pathways like everybody else um, but I think promotion goes a long way and I think I'm really pleased to see that we're getting that word of mouth because I think that's when you kind of know you're doing something right when people 100%. are saying come and work yeah come and work in Wolverhampton or go and see Wolverhampton and we've had neighbour neighbour and trust reach yeah. out to us now yeah. and come and visit to see what the boot camp looks like asking us about our recruitment and retention and you know it's taken the boot camps now had its one year anniversary hasn't it Hayley 
lovely. So we've done one year with four intakes of the boot camp, which has been fantastic. I think there's um, 37 staff that have gone through that. So that's that's a, a lot of staff that we've taken. Yeah. That's across all the portfolios, obviously, not just district nurses. But but yeah, 37 staff have been through the boot camp over those four those four sessions. And the next one's due to start uh, mid February. So hopefully our new recruits um, across all the portfolios will then obviously go on to that one. Um, but just another thing that we we developed uh, within the district nurses is a third year student nurse pathway because we recognise that our student nurses are our future workforce. Um, so myself and Sophia, who was our previous matron, she uh, we developed with our pre-reg team in the trust a third year student nurse pathway. So we intake eight student nurses per year uh, with the expression of interest of community nursing and they have 16 weeks through their third year and they go round our community portfolios and then hopefully at the end of that uh, they'll secure a job with us so that's kind of a pathway for them as well but also for us um, you know to welcome them in into our teams which is really positive uh, and some of them have done as well so that's really great. All right. Can I can I just embark on a, a little bit of the the daily operational detail of of your roles? Um, so one of the things that, that I've been interested in for a little while is you know technology being brought into um, roles, particularly like yours. I'm not talking virtual wards particularly. I'm talking about on the ground. Let's say you are with um, one of your service receivers patients. And you're, you're just a little bit concerned about maybe it's a wound, could be anything, skin, whatever it might be. How can you um, consult with a, a, a more senior clinical colleague about is this ground for concern or is it OK or do we need to blue light them? You know, how, how do they get? I know this ex, experience will play a role here. But, you know, if you're a relatively new district nurse, how do you go about just verifying that your hunch, your diagnostic yeah. is is correct? Yeah, I think I think what we try to I mean, dig digital is at the forefront, isn't it? And we're still in well, the I've seen, just state. to be clean. I've seen quite recently, you know, VR headsets where consultants yeah. can link with a district nurse. So the district nurse can key into that. And literally, a consultant can be looking at the patient in real time with the district nurse and the patient's yeah. voice, and they can have a conversation together. But it's all remote. You know, this is from the patient's home. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the way forward, because actually it, it, it reduces duplication of visits. So it stops us. What we used to do is historically come back and say that patient needs a senior review because yeah. I'm concerned that they're deteriorating. So we haven't got VR headsets, unfortunately, which would be absolutely fantastic. And we are in discussions with a company called Silhouette that offers some digital solutions around particularly wound care and things. And they have a wound care buddy app where you, you're able to kind of take pictures and remote be able to um, kind of like put a treatment planning for that patient to support whoever's actually with that patient and that's something that we're working towards because it almost gives us a bit of a, a trajectory of that patient as well so we can see when they're declining and kind of intervene before it gets too bad so at the, so that's something we're working um, towards but at the moment we do, we do like video consultations yeah. so they're video in to a senior to have that conversation the senior would be able to look at the wound they'd be able to have a healthy conversation and actually not only does it help us get the right treatment plan for the patient at that point and we can determine and navigate their journey but it also educates the member of staff at the same time which is like you know it's a win-win isn't it the patient gets what they need um, but the the nurse that may be a little bit more junior gets a bit of a, a learning opportunity yeah and, and, and reassurance that, as well yeah, you know absolutely. reassurance that, that yeah, actually absolutely. this is going to be all right yeah good yeah. Oh, I, had, I had to ask you know and please I can tell you I I, I reckon all organizations like yours it won't be very long before you are in the world of it, VR and headsets and so on and they're just like it's not even it's not even innovative and extraordinary it's just a mainstay yeah of what you do because the technology exists so why wouldn't you embrace it doing what you do i mean ultimately it might sound expensive 
to invest in headsets and so on, but you're going to save tons of money in the end, you know, by um, not duplicating effort, for example. Yeah, All right, so that was the one thing. The other thing I wanted to ask about was this issue around connectivity, because I, 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 I mean, I think Wolverhampton's got 5G. I think I'm right in saying that. But a lot of other places haven't. And in the time before 5G, you know, what would you be doing? You know, it, it, houses are notoriously not necessarily reliable for interconnectivity and so on. Do you have a problem in Wolverhampton at all? Or do members of your team and how do you overcome it? If so, if you can't report in real time, for example, do you do, you do a download in the evening? How does it work? So as I'd briefly touched on with regards to our allocation system, it is a live system. Um, it's called eCommunity. So that's where all the allocation is is completed. Um, and it, it is a live system. So, you know, with regards to connectivity, I think there are some hotspots across the city where there are some, you know, issues with the 5G, etc. However, the list of patients that the, the staff member um, has got allocated to them for that day, um, it, it does download onto their phone. So should they not have right. connectivity, they are still able to access that list. So they still be able to see those patients safely access their NHS number, you know, get access into the property if they need a key safe, etc. So they are able, um, they are able to to be able to use that. All right, thank you. And then the final thing I'm interested in, you, you did, uh, Lee, I think you touched on it earlier, is assuring personal safety, you know, particularly in the winter months, I would suggest if you're on, on an eight to eight, you've got at least four hours where you're going to be operating in darkness and so on. Um, as you've already said, you know, you might be observed to be some kind of a prescriber and so on. What do you do about personal safety? How do you how do you assure that? So we, we operate with a loan working um, policy. So we double up um, out of hours, um, particularly darker when it's darker, early dark nights, yeah. um, we double up. So it'll be two nurses going out. Because allocation is a live system, we can see and visualise where all of our nurses are. And our group manager, Rachel, would be like, it's a bit like Big Brother, so we can see where yeah. all our nurses are across the city. But if we look like, if it looks like somebody's spent maybe too long with a patient that ordinarily wouldn't be um the case we can re it'll kind of trigger us to ring them and check in are you okay um it, likewise if they haven't got to their patient mm -hmm. at a time that we'd have expected them to we can check in with them again um we have alert systems on our system for any patient that is that could pose a risk to us or the the environment could pose a risk to us or the the area of the city um we automatically put a double up in anyway and we make sure that everyone knows when we're going into that property and when we've left that property um we are looking at other um we've got skyguard um, which is a system which is um, GPS and we, we yeah. can kind of trigger an alert. We are working with our security department though to look at other devices so there's ones where it looks like an ID badge and then you can actually if you press a button you can actually whoever what, that goes to like a, a standardized like help desk so to speak but they can hear the conversations and then they can make a decision based on what they can hear as to whether to send um further support to that location so we're looking at that as well um but that's not implemented yes but we, yes but we know other neighboring organizations use something similar no, it's so, look, I think it's a horrible that we have to talk about it, but it's such an important part of, you know, things like recruitment and retention. People want to feel safe doing this yeah. most rewarding, but, you know, challenging of of jobs, I think. Yeah. Well, OK, we've got about five minutes to go. Uh, Vanda has asked a question. She said, uh, is there a nationally recognised district nurse qualification? Yes, I briefly talked um, touched upon it. It's the district nurse specialist um, qualification, which is a twelve month program. Um, it's degree or master's accredited, dependent on whether they've already got a degree or not. Um, and it takes them through the fundamentals of district nursing. So it gives them some leadership. It gives them a leadership module to be able to lead a, lead a team. There's a change module, health assessment, um, health assessment prescribing. prescribing. So it gives them everything to be a registered 
district nurse with spe specialist qualifications and skills that then will support our complex patients in community. And there has been nationally a decline in the uptake of that specialist qualification. And that's probably because there's been a decline in recruiting into district nurses as a whole. And we know um, for the last few years there's been a decline. Um, but we're really pushing. When, and that's does, part when, of when, does a, when does a new nurse have to decide that they want to be a district nurse as opposed to a, 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 a different sort of a nurse? So we, we tend to ask that they have um, two years experience because we want them to get the fundamentals of nursing first, gain the, the basics and the core foundations of what a community yeah. nurse is. And then we feel that they're in the right place to be able to apply. We do expression of interest because you only get so many places per year um, that are funded nationally. So we're, we've got four at the moment that are currently doing it. So there's one per team. They have to be mentored by somebody with that qualification so they can sign them off all their competencies so they'll have a competency framework on top of um, doing their modules um, at university um, so we say two years um, but sometimes there, are, there has been a couple of people that have had less than two years but for whatever reason have done other nursing so yes, they've been really like you know they've excelled and they're in the right that it's the right time for them and actually they're they're fantastic band sixes now part of our team as um, with that qualification and they're a massive asset to the to the team so yeah fantastic well look i think we'll, we'll kind of leave it there i think um that has just been the most illuminating and insightful uh, chat with the two of you. Um, may I send my personal best wishes to all of you in Wolverhampton and Walsall uh, who are embarked on this. Um, I'm a huge fan of the area, having lived there for about 14 years before I moved down to where I live now in South Wales. Um, but the service that you provide, you know, if, if ever you doubt the value and you just wonder whether it's all worth it. All you've just got to think is, do you know what it is? You know, you are providing support and nurture and reassurance and confidence to people that without that, uh, they, they just they just lose hope. And that's a terrible situation to be in. So particularly over the Christmas period, can we say to you all, thank you very much. You, you're doing the most magnificent job. And you can be certain that the uh, citizens of Wolverhampton District absolutely appreciate it. So thank you very much, both of you. Um, hasn't thank that you. been brilliant? Hasn't that been brilliant, everybody? With Lee and Hayley, uh, wishing you all a very good Christmas and a wonderful and healthy New Year. And there will be more of these Let's Talk Talks the other side. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Bye bye.